All right, we are at the top of the hour, so we are going to go ahead and get started. I know people are still filtering in here, so we will let that continue to happen here. Um, but let me share my screen. All right, so to get started, what I wanted to do is uh, put this picture up on the screen for you. So I'm sure some of you know at least one of these two people, uh, probably the person on the right. What you may not know uh, is, the, is who the man on the left is. Uh, he's actually famous for delivering a talk that was based on answering this question. And the question is, what wisdom would you try to impart to the world if you knew it was your last chance? His name was Randy Pausch, a father, a husband, and a computer scientist at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. Randy had already been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer when he was asked to give a last lecture, one in a series where professors imagine what they would talk about in their final lesson. Most people don't deliver one under such pressing circumstances, which made his lecture even more compelling. His talk to students at his school was recorded and became a YouTube sensation. Soon, he was on Oprah and Good Morning America, and then finally, he came out with a book called The Last Lecture. Randy's story is remarkable partly because it showed great human resilience in the face of personal tra tragedy. He knew his time on earth was limited. He knew the day he would die, as he said, would be like pushing his family off a cliff. So he set out while still strong to do what he could to build a net that would catch them and cushion the blow of his departure. I've picked out a few of his notable quotes from his lecture and his book. One is the key question to keep asking is, are you spending your time on the right things? Because time is all you have. Be prepared. Luck is truly where preparation meets opportunity. To be cliche, death is a part of life and it's going to happen to all of us. I have the blessing of getting a little bit of advance notice and I'm able to optimize my use of time down the home stretch. Randy died quietly at home in July of 2008, about 10 months after he gave his last lecture. He was surrounded by his family, and I think it's safe to say he left his family and his children and the world with a deep personal message about his values, his beliefs, his wisdom, and not just for his wife and children, but really also his children's children, the chain of generations we all have a link in. I think if you could ever say that someone had a good death, it was certainly Randy Pausch. The details of Randy's death stand in contrast to those of this man, the actor and producer James Gandolfini. You may remember him as Tony Soprano, the mafia crime boss and lead character in the HBO hit series The Sopranos. Unlike Randy, James died suddenly at age 51 while on a trip to Italy. It was a shock to his fans and his family. No one saw it coming. Unfortunately, he hadn't done a thorough job planning his affairs. He left 80% of his estate to his sisters and daughter in such a way that it triggered a painful $30 million tax bill. And unlike Randy, James did not get to play a role in writing his final legacy. Instead, his ending had a strong resemblance to the controversial last scene of The Sopranos. If you are a fan, you may remember it. Tony arranges to meet his wife for dinner at a local diner. First, his wife, Carmela, arrives, then his son, AJ. Tony orders fried onion rings for the table while they await his daughter, Meadow. Tony keeps looking at the door, checking for his daughter's arrival. The camera jump cuts to the daughter outside, trying to park her car, and then back to Tony. The tension builds. He keeps looking up. We're all wondering who's going to come in the door, Meadow or a mafia hitman? And then finally, the screen goes black. The finale to the six season series ends. The storyline left unresolved. No deathbed scene, no final words, just a jarring cut to black. Just as James Gandolfini's real life ended too. So, in the opposite manner of Randy Pausch, James Gandolfini did not get to write his story for the ages. I hope you can see in our little tale of two families here a hint of the topics we're going to touch on here today. 
namely the importance and seriousness of thinking through your legacy and planning for the next generation. It's never too soon to do that. Now, before we go on, I just want to stop and just take a quick second to introduce myself if we have not met before. My name is Eric Hagen. I'm president of Capital Consulting Group, or CCG. CCG consists of myself, our chief investment officer, Tom Fox, uh, financial advisors, Dan Oshman and Rana Grant, as well as our client support, John Knudsen and Marilyn Westmark. Together, we steward long-term relationships with our clients and work only for our clients. We are an independent firm. We are not owned by a bank, by an insurance company, or by some large financial institution. We are located in Eden Prairie, Minnesota, southwest suburbs of the Twin Cities. And we serve people all over Minnesota. And with our 100% virtual advisor capabilities, we also serve people all over the country as well. Primarily, we can help you see your entire financial situation, both today, as well as every year into the future, through our personal wealth planning services. After today's message, if you'd like to learn more about that, go to clearfinancialfuture.com and watch the short two minute video. And we give our clients life savings the attention it deserves through our Smart Mix portfolio solution. Smart Mix is our personalized portfolio solution for individual investors. So now that you know a little bit about us, let's talk about legacy planning. And first of all, I just wanna say thank you for taking some of the time out of your busy schedule and committing your time to learning more about legacy planning for the next generation. Now you may be wondering, why is a financial professional up here today talking about legacy planning for the generations? Well, I do this as a service to my clients and, the, and our community here because I've seen some difficult, unhappy situations when families don't think about these issues. When no legacy planning is done, we see a range of unhappy outcomes that often impact multiple generations. And we'll talk more about those here in a minute. Of course, we don't want that to happen to you and your families. So that's why I do this presentation. I also want to assure you that this is not a sales presentation. You will not hear anything remotely close to a sales pitch today. And at the end of today's message, we have a nice summary of all the information that we'd be happy to get out to you. Um, uh, so stick around and uh, I'll show you how you can get your hands on this, uh, this really nice uh, kind of threefold uh, brochure that summarizes today's message. And I will also be extending an invitation to you to start developing your own legacy plan for your family. So we'll talk more about that uh, later on. Mostly, I'm just excited to be talking to you today about legacy planning. And when it comes to today's topic, it's not the stuffy old version of traditional estate planning. Instead, we see legacy planning in a broader, more positive light that will help you find meaning in your life and make sure it counts for something to your loved ones who will stay behind a while longer. As we saw with Randy Pausch in the last lecture, he recounted his childhood dreams, the outstanding people he had met in his lifetime, and the lessons he learned along the way. The lecture has been seen and read by millions of people. Now that's a legacy. Yours may not be as far reaching as his, but it will be just as meaningful to your own family, more so even because it's yours. So let's continue with trying to understand the seriousness of the problem many families face here, and then look at some solutions that can start to help you and your family avoid the worst kinds of results. We can see here one aspect of the problem that we face. Many people have not thought through how they want their money and estate handled after they're gone. They think they have forever. What could go wrong, right? And not reflected here are people who have given it some thought, but not until recently, or not fully, as in the case of James Gandolfini. If things do go wrong, maybe you die before you get everything set up. If you get hit by the proverbial bus before you even have a chance to tell people that you love them, much less write a will or start writing down your memories. It's a terrible thought, right? Well, let's just consider what could happen in the aftermath of your untimely death. Your family is left grieving and in the dark about what you own, where everything is, and what your wishes are. Think about your closest next of kin, your spouse or your children. First, they're in shock to learn of your untimely death. They start going through your papers. What will they find? 
a neat folder marked open in case of my death with all of your assets listed and your wishes clearly spelled out or a hodgepodge of papers that make no sense to anyone but you now that you're gone. Or your estate planning documents are missing, incomplete, or in conflict with one another. Perhaps you never got around to making a will, so no one knows who you wanted your assets to go to. Or if you did sign a will, maybe it conflicts with your beneficiary designations. This happens. People update their will when they get remarried, but forget to update their IRA and other investment beneficiary designations, which still lists the ex-spouse. Let me ask you, if you died tomorrow, how would your assets be distributed? Do you even know? Family members start arguing over what you would have wanted. Granted, you're not around to see the turmoil, but I'm asking you to imagine it now. Without clear instructions from you, what would your family members say to one another? Would there be any arguments over what you would have wanted? You may have heard uh, of normal, loving families who turned on one another after a parent died without a will. It unfortunately can bring out the worst in people. If there's no will or trust, the estate goes into probate. This means the court takes over and divides the assets based on state law. This may or may not be what you want. Probate fees are deducted from your estate, leaving less for your heirs. If you were to die tomorrow, do you know if your estate would owe estate taxes? Perhaps one of the worst things to contemplate about sudden death is leaving special sentiments unsaid. There are people who say, I love you at the end of every phone conversation, just to make sure it's the last thing said if they do get hit by a bus. But that doesn't really do the job of telling your spouse, your children, your grandchildren, how you truly feel about them. So let me ask you, if you got hit by the proverbial bus tomorrow, what things will you wish you had said to the people that you love? And in the end, the impact of your life is diminished between the confusion, family squabbles, messy estate planning, and all the things you wish you'd said but didn't, your legacy comes up short. The aftermath of your death is not nearly as positive as it could have been. And what else could go wrong? For some, a fate worse than death is sudden incapacity. You suffer a stroke, you get hit by the bus, and rather than dying, you end up in a coma. In some ways, this is worse than dying unprepared because you have to go on living. So who will make your decisions about your health care? Someone you love and trust? Or will you be at the mercy of someone you didn't even know because uh, you didn't set things up properly? Here's what can go wrong. Your medical wishes are not honored because nobody knows what they are. Hospitals are obligated to do whatever is necessary to keep people alive, even if it involves ventilators and feeding tubes. If this is not what you would want, you have to state those wishes now. If you want to appoint a loved one to make medical decisions on your behalf, you have to set this up now while you are still of sound mind and body. And here's what else. Your money is frozen. Your bills go unpaid and your investments are left unattended because you never signed a power of attorney appointing a trusted person to act on your behalf. No one else has the authority to transfer money or pay bills or do anything with your finances as long as you are incapacitated. So here's the problem. Planning, uh, people equate estate planning with death planning and therefore block it out and never do anything or not enough. The quote here sums it up. One of the greatest obstacles in estate planning is the perpetuating of death denial. Most people don't want to plan for post-death lies because death is a scary topic to even think about. This is true both on a financial level, but also probably more importantly, on an emotional and spiritual level. That lifetime of experiences, hard-earned wisdom and insight that make up our values never get discussed and never get passed on to the next generation. And that's the real loss for everyone. Now, you may be thinking, well, my family knows how I feel about them. And I'm not a best-selling author or Hollywood movie star with tens of millions in the bank. So what's it matter if I don't take this issue seriously? What are the consequences? The consequences of having no estate plan are tragic. As Lawrence Greenberg notes here, heirs may be subjected to a number of obstacles, such as probate, 
creditors, lawsuits, judgments, and legal fees, all of which can compromise the value of the legacy. Common problems that arise when no one thinks about estate planning include no will or trust, overlooked provisions such as guardianship for minors, no tax planning, financial strains, cash shortage for survivors, and also sometimes decisions are not communicated to the next generation. Details are not revealed until after death. Family tension arises after the will is read. And there's a reluctance to make a plan or even update a plan. It's not really a good picture, right? Which is why attorneys, accountants, and financial professionals have been pressing their clients for years to do estate planning. The benefits of estate planning are very real, it's like spelling out healthcare wishes and making sure possessions go to heirs that you choose without wrangling or dispute and avoiding additional unplanned legal expenses and providing for loved ones not otherwise protected. But, uh, but traditional estate planning often doesn't capture the fullness of our lives and our values. So what's missing are the intangible assets that we've collected, often the fruits of a life well lived. They include two types of things not included in traditional estate planning, such as character assets, your values, health, spirituality, heritage, purpose, life experiences, talents, plans for giving. And then there's intellectual assets, your business systems, alliances, ideas, skills, traditions, reputation, and wisdom. Now, you're probably saying to yourself, well, that's a grim picture. We don't want that to happen to our family. Is there a way to achieve all these things? Not just the nuts and bolts of traditional estate planning. And the answer is yes. It's called generational planning. And it recognizes that we are all that we are all much more than just our physical assets accounted for in our estate plan. So here's our definition of generational planning. Generational planning is a modern, intentional, fun even, two-phase process that does away with the worst aspects of estate planning and helps you plan your legacy. So generational planning has two objectives. The first objective is legacy planning, a process for passing on a family's tangible wealth and assets. And then the second objective is conveying your family's values in history to the next generation. Both are done for the benefit of the next generation. And it's also important to say that generational planning is not driven by documents in the way of a stuffier estate planning process. And so in thinking about the people closest to you, here are some thoughts on key considerations to a successful legacy plan for the generations. First, consider your spouse if you're married. If you were to die first, you need to ensure sufficient income for the rest of your spouse's life, maybe through, uh, through insurance or just making sure there are enough assets to draw from. You also want to make sure that whichever of you goes first, the surviving spouse would be able to manage the finances alone. You know, we see many cases where the husband makes the investment decisions and the wife pays the bills. This is a natural division of labor in a marriage, and they are each doing what they do best. Then one of them dies and the other must take over without having been trained to do so. In a successful legacy, the married couple, while they're both alive, plan ahead and make sure that either spouse can carry on and manage the finances regardless of which spouse goes first. Children need to be prepared for their inheritance. We've all heard stories about trust fund babies and inheritors who have no appreciation or respect for the money that was left to them. Without the proper guidance, their tendency is to spend it rather than preserving it for their own future or for future generations. Inheritance planning starts with an understanding of the basic values upon which the inheritance was built, which is to preserve and grow your family's wealth. These values need to be passed on to the kids. Then there are the practical matters of how to specifically invest the money and how to withdraw it without incurring unnecessary taxes and fees. As for the grandchildren, you want them to understand how you lived and what you lived for. Sometimes it's easier to skip a generation when passing on these values. Grandchildren usually have a greater appreciation than children do for what life was like when you were young and what you learned from your experiences. So seize the opportunity now to start sharing some family stories and conveying some of those memories and values that you grew up with. And finally, Think about all the people you've touched in your life. 
Think about the causes that you care about, the organizations that are doing good work in the world and that you contribute to now. Maybe you'd like to leave something to them so they can continue those good works. Now, naturally, you may be saying to yourself, okay, this makes sense, but how can I do this in a way that is not overwhelming, complicated, or extremely expensive? Well, you don't have to be overwhelmed. You can follow a six-step legacy planning process to start leaving your mark for the next generation. Let me take you through a quick overview of these six steps. Part one involves planning for incapacity. We like to get this out of the way first because it's so essential and so easy to do. Incapacity planning is so easy, it's surprising everyone hasn't done it. People of all ages should do it because an accident or a stroke could happen to anyone at any time. There are forms for this. For healthcare, all you have to do is name a person to interact with doctors and make medical decisions on your behalf. This may be your spouse or one of your children or a close friend. For finances, you would simply sign a power of attorney giving another person legal authority to act on your behalf. This would allow them to pay bills, transfer money, and do what's needed to keep your finances in order during the time you're unable to do it yourself. Again, it can be a spouse, an adult child, a close friend, or even a trusted professional. You must be competent to sign these forms, which is why we want you to do it now. This is step one of savvy legacy planning. One that you have, once you have this checked off, you'll feel much, much better. And then you'll be able to uh, prepare to tackle step number two. Part two is to get organized. You know you've been meaning to do this, or maybe you're already pretty well organized, but not in a way that would make sense to your loved ones if you suddenly weren't around. So your objective in this step is to uh, prepare for the real business of estate planning. First, you'll need to identify all the property you own so you'll know how to divvy it up among your beneficiaries. This includes all your savings accounts, investment accounts, retirement accounts, real estate, business interests, significant personal property like jewelry, artwork, everything. Before you ever sit down with an attorney to have your estate planning documents drawn up, you will need to have this list. Another reason to do this is to determine if your estate will be subject to estate taxes. If it is, that is, if the total value of your estate exceeds the estate tax exemption amount, you will want to talk to your attorney about some of the legal ways to reduce or avoid estate taxes. If you were to go on the internet, you could read about so many celebrities who didn't do the proper planning and whose estates owed millions of dollars in estate taxes that could have been avoided. If you don't read about a particular celebrity's estate plan, it means they did it right. They set up a trust that both saved estate taxes and kept their affairs private. And of course, you want to make things easy on your spouse and your children. Make it so they have access to your important papers and passwords. Help them know what to do first, like uh, like take care of your pets or get your mail. In a non-legal letter to your survivors, you can say anything you want. You can give funeral instructions, tell them what you want done with your Facebook account, tell them where the key to your home safe is, anything. And we can help you with this. All right, in part three, you'll be thinking about the people you love and the causes you care about. This is in preparation for part four, which is the real business of estate planning. For some of you, part three will be easy. You want to leave everything to your spouse and you have one or two favorite charities that you wanna support too. But you have to think about the contingencies. What if your spouse goes before you do? Do you want everything to go to your kids, divided equally among them or distributed according to need? What about grandchildren? What about other relatives or friends that you may want part of your estate or some of your prized possessions to go to? And what if you have special situations, like a child you don't feel is ready to handle an inheritance, or a special needs child who would lose out on medical benefits if there there were a large inheritance? These are all things that need to be considered before you start working on your estate planning documents. The more you've thought through your family and charitable wishes, the more efficient the estate planning process will be, and the more money you will save. Also in this step is the important process of preparing beneficiaries for their inheritance. Now, some families may wanna be completely open about who's going to get what, while others may prefer to be more secretive to avoid family battles. Maybe it's better to have those family battles, if they're going to happen, 
while you are still around to mediate. In any case, you want the people who will be inheriting your assets to know how to manage them, to carry on your intent to preserve and grow the assets and not just spend them on frivolous things or lose them to taxes. This is the time to talk to your spouse and kids about what they might get if you die and give them some lessons on how to manage their inheritance. This will be an extremely valuable part of your legacy. Now we get to the traditional part of estate planning. All those decisions you made in part three about who should get what will need to be legalized. That is, there will need to be a mechanism to transfer those assets to your loved ones in a legal manner. So let's take a look at that. Now, this isn't always done via a will. Sometimes you can transfer assets through account titling. If you hold title as joint tenants with rights of survivorship, and if one joint tenant dies, the property will automatically transfer to the other joint tenant without going through probate. Another way is through beneficiary designations. If you have an IRA, you signed a beneficiary designation in which you named the person or persons who should inherit your IRA if you were to pass away. This also allows assets to pass directly to the beneficiary outside of probate and regardless of what your will says. There are several legal ways to transfer assets to loved ones after death, but they all need to be coordinated. You may have some accounts titled jointly. You may have signed beneficiary designations. You may also need to have a trust, depending on how complex your situation is and whether or not your estate is subject to estate taxes. You will also need a will to pick up the leftovers. Some people's estate plans are very simple. They barely need to see a lawyer. They can do everything through account titling, beneficiary designations, and a simple will. Other people do need more legal advice. We can help you make that determination and refer you to an estate planning attorney when we uh, get to this stage of the process. Or if you have an attorney that you already work with, we can work with that attorney to coordinate things on our end, such as making sure your accounts are titled properly. Depending on how much thought you gave to your beneficiaries in part three, this step should be pretty quick and straightforward. It's a matter of executing the wishes you already identified. Laying all this groundwork in part three will save on legal fees. At the same time, you don't wanna rush anything. Talking with an attorney can sometimes make you aware of possibilities that you didn't know about before, such as planning for contingencies or drawing up the documents so that they cannot be contested. Good attorneys definitely earn their fees. Now we get to the fun part, creating your family legacy. This is where you really make your life count for something by leaving behind a piece of yourself. Now, how you do this will be up to you. We have worksheets and guidelines and get you started. You might start by simply capturing memories and writing down certain thoughts, such as what you want your children and grandchildren to know about you. You may be planning to compile family photos or favorite recipes to hand down. Maybe you have a special skill, such as gardening or woodworking, that you would like to pass on to certain family members. Now is the time to start thinking about these intangible assets that will make your legacy so valuable to your family. Part six comes later, but it's no less essential than parts one through five. It's great that you're doing all this planning early, long before you plan to leave this earth, but that means a lot can happen between now and then. So you will need to keep an open eye on your plan and revise it if anything changes. Your plan is not set in stone. As your family composition changes, you will want to revisit your plan. Whenever there's a marriage, a divorce, a death, birth of a child, you'll want to take a look at your plan. Or you might change your mind about something. You can always amend your documents for any reason at all. Remember, having the wrong people inherit your money is almost worse than no estate plan. So that's our six-part legacy planning process, and we're getting close to finishing, so let's review it briefly. We started by looking at all the differences between the Randy Pausch story and the, Ga the James Gandolfini story. And the key takeaway there was that your legacy is going to be written no matter what, for better or for worse. So let's make sure we control the final narrative of our life because things can happen suddenly, death or incapacitation. And we saw the consequences of not being prepared, the pain, 
confusion, and anger among family members left behind. Then we were introduced to the concept of generational planning and saw how it differs from traditional estate planning. And that led us to the understanding that the first step in generational planning is to ensure that our tangible wealth and assets get left to the right people or organizations. And then to do that, we've just introduced you to the six major steps in the legacy planning process. And as you look at those six steps, you're possibly thinking that that sounds like a lot to achieve. I feel that way too, because it is. But what we've found over the years is that when we work together and guide people through the generational planning process, they experience two things. The first one is great relief that it's done. The second is new excitement and renewed energy to focus on the non-financial aspects of generational planning. This is the reflective part. It's not legal. It's not business. It's the part where we get to look back on our personal journey and share the stories that we carry in our hearts. This is our gift to the next generation. They may, there, there may be words or stories, pictures or actions. They may provide hope. They may provide healing. But just as important are the things we say and do that bring us meaning because we realize that we are the carriers of wisdom for our family. And from generation to generation, each of us is a link in the chain that binds our families together. And that link is the mark that we leave, our legacy. And that's why I think many of you are here today and why I'd like to make a suggestion. Let's work together. Hopefully you are all motivated now to get started on your legacy plan. So let's maintain that motivation by taking action. Here's the idea. Working together, we will develop a plan for doing the many things that need to be done. One of the reasons people don't get around to estate planning is that the tasks seem too overwhelming and that they don't know where to start. So we would like to break it into chunks for you where we set some goals and establish a timetable for implementing them. For example, in week one, you might sign your healthcare directive. In week two, you might sign power of attorney for financial decisions. We have a checklist of things that need to be done to get your plan in order. And together, we can go through that list and check things off as they're done. Working together, we can help you stay on track. We can also share resources. If you need a referral to an estate planning attorney or tax advisor, we can introduce you to some of the professionals that we work with, um, with whom we know are good at what they do. By working together, we can hold each other accountable. We'll have frequent check-ins and deadline dates for getting things done. This is all for your benefit, to keep you motivated and engaged so you'll carry through on your plans. And we have a way for you to start even right now. So where do you go from here? Well, let's start with a complimentary legacy planning assessment to see where you are now in the planning process. Imagine how you will feel when your legacy is all set. A trusted person is ready to step in and help with healthcare decisions or financial dealings if it becomes necessary. Your records are all organized and accessible to your loved ones. Your spouse and other loved ones will be provided for after your death. By leaving behind both tangible and intangible assets, you will be remembered for your unique contributions to your family and the world. Legacy planning is not hard. You just have to get started. So let's work together. And that brings us to the close of this formal presentation. Again, a great place to start is with a complimentary legacy planning assessment and this helps us see where you are now in the planning process. If you'd like to take advantage of this, just go to our website, click on schedule an appointment, and then look for legacy planning assessment. And to get directly to my calendar, you can go to www.schedulewitheric.com. And uh, again, just scroll down to where it says legacy planning assessment. All right, that is it for today's message. Thank you again for taking the time to be here with me. I do hope to see you on the calendar soon, and I hope that you found a lot of value in today's message. With that, I wish you a wonderful rest of your day, and I'll look for you soon. Bye now.